Kingston Town can't win. Burton Crusher and our Waverley Star, stride for stride. Cometh the hour, cometh the legend, Weeks has done it. Joined here today by legendary NRL coach, six, six times uh, Daly M Coach of the Year and of course the coach of the Melbourne Storm, Craig Valling. Craig, thanks for having us. No, I appreciate you having me along guys and um, yeah, like I say, um, been a long time in sport, you know, obviously rugby league but um, you know, I'm also interested in most sports and obviously horse racing as well. Yeah, that's awesome. So at the time of recording, uh, last night, the Storm have just had a dominant win over the ladder leaders, Penrith. That's a great scalp to get, especially at this time of year. Uh, you must be wrapped and looking forward to the business end now. Yeah, obviously um, it's been a pretty, pretty tough year for us as far as injuries go. And, uh, you know, our form's been a little bit up and down at times, uh, which you'd probably expect. But, um, you know, it was a really good performance last night uh, against the Panthers. You know, they've you know, been probably the top side of the last three years or so. And... Uh, to beat them at home um, it was a really good effort but you know the big thing I was happy about was our defence um, it uh, had a real toughness in it last night and hopefully uh, we can hang on to that attribute and hopefully um, you know it'll do, do us well in the finals So you're a, uh, a you've won a premiership as a player and a coach, can you just tell us a little bit about how that transition came about and for you when you were I guess playing did you always know you wanted to be a coach when your career was done? Um, no, not not really. It was only to, when I was getting towards the end of my career, and you know, when I was getting towards the end of my career, it, it, it was before you know full time footy. So we were all part time. I was an electrician by trade, um, but as I got towards the end of my career, I I wanted to stay involved in the game, you know, somehow. Um, so the road I, I picked was to stay in a strength conditioning that, that was probably my strength as a player I wasn't I wasn't overly skillful I probably wasn't overly smart I probably wasn't you know I wasn't quick I wasn't that big or whatever but I, I was fit and um, so that was a real interest to me so I'd done some strength conditioning courses and and that was going to be my way of staying into the in, in the game um, but um, just again I think it was uh, 92 when I had me last year, um, Tim Sheens was coaching the Raiders at the time, and I was coaching reserve grade. I uh, oh, sorry, playing reserve grade, and you know, basically I was going to retire the next year. So he offered me the to coach the under twenty ones, um, which again, that was a way for me to stay involved in the game, and you know, I accepted that, and you know, I started coaching. Um, I think I coached the twenty ones for three years, and I coached reserve grade for a year. Uh, then I was an assistant uh, to Mal Meninga when he first came in as a coach. And then after the year after that, I, went, I actually went to the Brisbane Broncos as their performance coordinator. So I had five years up there and it was interesting how it worked out up there at, um, at, at the Broncos. You know, Wayne Bennett, he didn't have any assistants, you know, coaching assistants. So because of my coaching background, I, you know, like in the pre-season, I was really busy with the uh, performance coordinator's role but uh, in season it probably wasn't as hectic so I started doing a little bit of uh, work on the opposition for Wayne he didn't sort of really do a whole heap on the opposition so I started you know doing some of that for him and then the coaching role sort of evolved from there Um, it's funny how it works out you know like I'd, I'd coached in Canberra for five years. Um, well, you know, I was up at the Broncos there for like four or five years, and um, and you know, I, I'd never ever got a you know offer for an NRL job, you know, as a coach. And then in uh, two thousand and two, uh, Wayne was coaching, also coaching the State of Origin team, and he was coaching. The, you know, the origin side before as well, but he'd always come back for the Broncos game. So during the week, I'd, I'd coach him and then he'd come back, you know, for the game. For I, I can't actually remember what the reason was, but um, I remember him ringing me up in 2002 and saying, listen, I won't be coming back um, for the games between the origin games this year. So I think he must have decided to keep the players in camp and so he, he stayed with them. And so I ended up, coaching what became as the Baby Broncos. 
um, in 2002 and we played the West Tigers down at uh, Campbelltown and um, we actually won that night. Uh, I think we had about nine or ten players you know, out playing Origin and, and Wayne wasn't there and because, you know, again, that one game, then I, I seemed to be the f- flavour of the month for a coaching job. You know, it, 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 it can be quite fickle how our life works at times and you know the corners that you go around sometimes you run to a roadblock and other times it just opens up but that's how I end up sort of and then I got a a couple of offers from you know different Sydney clubs and um oh sorry different NRL clubs and I decided on uh the Melbourne Storm so it uh it's interesting how, how it all happens and just on that uh with the storm, you know, we're probably not noted here in Melbourne for being a big rugby town. No. Um, but you know, the storm have had so much success here. So, what I kind of pointed you in the direction of coming to the storm when that offer was first presented to you, rather than going to New South Wales, where it's you know more more of a, a rugby heartland. Yeah, um, there was a couple of points. Uh, probably the main point was John Rubo, who was the um, you know he, he basically started the team down here, um, and he was the CEO at the time. Uh, so. He uh, he sold a very good story um, to me, and you know I, I knew he was a really genuine guy as well. So he was probably the main reason that he convinced me, and I liked the idea of actually going to a a place where rugby league wasn't the main game. Um, in that, you know, there can be a lot of pressure on when you know. In I've seen a little bit of that. In Brisbane and Canberra, not so much Canberra, I suppose, but in Brisbane, but but not a lot. Where, you know, sometimes, you know, when things ain't going so well, there's there's more pressure on. So I just like the idea of of being in a a town that where rugby league wasn't the number one game. And um, like I say, and you know, I find that now even you know players that come down uh, to Melbourne, they really like like that that point of difference, I suppose, from being in Queensland or New South Wales because, you know, they... Um, yeah, that's, that's right. It's not, you know, like, again, story in, in the paper, you know, down here for us, you know, for the storm is probably six pages back, whereas it's in New South Wales or Queensland, it's on the back page, you know. So, um, yeah, it's... I, I, I just enjoy that um, myself and I think most players do, you know. They... Um, you know, when they're away from the footy, you know, they want to be able to live a normal life. And, um, you know, I, I find that we can do that down here, you know, with the Storm. And looking at your your career at the Storm, uh, I'm hoping these stats are, are current. 360 games you've won, only 154 you've lost. So that's going at 70%, which is incredible. Uh, we know sometimes you can play well and still lose and sometimes you can play average and still win yeah, but yeah. is that winning culture and winning mentality something you've really prided yourself on? Oh yeah I, I don't you know, really count the wins and the losses but um, you know like everybody else I like winning um, you know I, I think my greatest strength is my work ethic you know like I, we've got a system that, that we that we work to and we stick to at the storm and I play my part and you know everyone needs to play their part they need to be making sure they're doing their job and doing the job the best they can so um you know like like i say i I think it's you know everyone likes winning but how how hard are you willing to work to win i think you know that that's that's the point and um like i say i think we're all down here you know we've got a really good staff and we've got a good group of players that are, are willing to work hard and get their job done and when everyone does that um, you're going to have some sort of success at some stage. We talk about great dynasties in sport. The you know the Storm and um, your your dynasty that you've kind of reigned over as coach was quite noted, and you've coached some unbelievable players. Um, you know, mainly your Cameron Smith and Billy Slater's. What's it like being around you know those great teams and those great superstar players every day? Do you think they they bring the best out of everyone else and they elevate people and bring them people uh, bring them along them uh, sorry bring them along with them. Um, and to, I guess, to achieve that greatness? Yeah, without a doubt. You know, you're talking about, you know, those players you're talking about there, um, obviously Cameron and Billy and, you know, Cooper Cronk at the time. And, um, you know, Greg Inglis was a wonderful player for us as well. And, um, you know, we, we've had some unbelievably good players. But the thing I like about, you know, those guys, it was that, that they were two men as well. It, it wasn't about, you know, for Cameron, it wasn't about Cameron Smith. For Billy, it wasn't about... 
you know, you, you need to have a certain selfishness to, um, you know, to be as good as they were. But at the end of the day, their main aim is to do what's right for the team. And with all due respect, you know, towards the end of their careers, those guys were the best coaches in the joint too. You know, like what they did on the field. Um, you know, we didn't expect them to coach off the field because you know they had enough workload to do to do it themselves. But um, like on the field, that, that they were just so cool, calm, collected. Um, you know, and especially towards the end of their careers with their experience, they just knew what to do. And you know, they were, with all, as I said, with all due respect, I think that they were probably more help to the other players than the coaches were at times, you know. That, that's how much influence they had on the team. And um, But because they were so team-orientated, um, yeah, it, it it made my job a fair bit easier, to be quite honest. And without, uh, without putting you on the spot, did you have a favourite player out of those guys? Without not having to be, yeah, just the, the best, but the, the favourite player that, that you kind of admired most out of, out of all of them? No, they... Um, Yeah, you know, like I'd consider Cameron probably the best player I've ever seen. You know, I'm 63 years old, so I've seen. You know, I've been following the game all, all my life. You know, so I consider him the best player I've ever seen, and mainly because of how good he was for how long. Like no one else has played 400 games in our competition. No one. He's the only one that's done that. So that's basically 20 years of of playing. And but the standard that he played at. That was the thing that um, divided him from other players. Like if you just look at state of origin, obviously guys like Wally Lewis and Andrew Johns, they were unbelievably you know, great in origin, and so was Cameron. But because of Cameron's quality over such a, a long period of time, as I said, you know, he, he's, he's the best, best player I've seen. You know? So, um, I, I, you know, I, I know probably... Having favourite players, you know, I, I always um, there's a couple of guys that, you know, like Cameron and Billy and even you know other players that would say that you know the, that I don't know how they seen it, but you know like p- favourite players. There was there's a couple of them. A guy called Dallas Johnson, who was a good player too. He played for Queensland, played with a couple of grand finals with us, um, played for Australia, and also uh, uh, Dale Finucane, who's playing at the Sharks now. Um, all the players that were around then always said that they, they were my favourites. And they probably were in a way that they were, with all, and again, with all due respect to those guys, they weren't the most talented players, but they were tough and they just worked hard. And they everything they got out of the game, and Dale's still getting out of the game, they earned it, and they earned, they earned it the hard way. And, um, and But they were just... You know, those sort of players that you have to have in your team that when someone needs to do the the stuff a lot of other players don't like doing, you know, those two, they just stepped up and, and got it done, you know. So, um, you know, I was sort of, I don't know, a bit of a, a soft, soft feeling for, uh, for guys like that, but th- th- they were tremendous for, for our club, both of them. And we know the Storm have built... Uh, such a strong brand, uh, everyone admires both culturally and on the field. Without giving away some trade secrets, what are what are some of the things, both uh, leadership and club values? What are some of the things you've you've done to implement that? Oh, I, I think um, you know, you don't, I, I, I don't need to think about it too much. You know, I don't think leaders need to think about it. It's, you know, what you've been brought up with your values and your beliefs, and. Um, I think you know they stick with you for most of like your beliefs probably change at times, but your values from when you got your values from your parents, you know your big brothers and sisters, your school teachers or your your coaches in junior sport, wherever you got your values that that you, you live your life by your values. So for me, living your life by your values is the same as coaching. You got to coach to your values, you know. And um, so I've always. My dad used to have a couple of um, sayings he used to used to um, mention quite often. Number one was 
hard workers get lucky. He said sometimes you mightn't get as lucky as you'd like as soon as you like, but you keep working hard and you'll get lucky. And the other one was always treat people the way you want to be treated. And um, so they were probably my two main values growing up and the, the hard work one I really believe in. You know, at the end of the day, anything you do in life is, you know, um, if it's important to you, well, it's worth putting the effort and the time in uh, to, to make sure you do that job or do that as good as you can do it because, you know, you don't get too many second chances. So you, you want to get it done right and that's always been, I suppose, the... Uh, the underlying value that I've lived by and that's so I live by that so I, I coach to that I think uh, Australians we're, we're known for our, our rivalries and state by state we uh, you know we enjoy the you know, Vic versus New South Wales and New South Wales versus Queensland that rivalry between New South Wales and Queensland state of origin we know it's intense but from from your side how intense is it and how much of a big big thing is the state of origin yeah, it's it, it's massive in our game. It's um, it's it, it's a um, a real good thing in our game to be quite honest. You know, I I, I think when I first started, um, there was more. Well, it's a strong word, but there was more hate in it then. I think now, you know, because there's a lot of teammates playing against each other. Well, not a lot, but. It can happen, you know, and... Um, sorry, sorry, but how does that go? Like, teammates, you know, your teammates on the weekend and then you rock up on yeah. a Wednesday night and then you got to bash the... Yeah, you know, shit the hell out of each other, yeah. How do you go as a coach too, knowing that, you know, you, you've probably got... You might have... You're going against some of your, your gun players, but at the same time you're representing, you, you know, your state yeah, um, I, and it's all or nothing. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, like, me sitting back watching it, I, like, you know, everyone in rugby league loves... You know, watching Origin. When Origins come around, you know, we all we all get excited about that. I used to be worried about, you know, when, because especially early, we used to have, we might have six or seven in Queensland and, you know, three or four in New South Wales. We always seem to have more in Queensland. But so I used to be worried about, you know, them getting hurt, you know, for the weekend or getting hurt for the Storm games. But after a couple of years, it was, well, you know, it is what it is. So, just sit, sit back and and enjoy the game. You know, because I, I, like I was worried about when some, one of our blokes get tackled or, or one of our blokes were going into tackle. You know, that they're going to get hurt. But like after a couple of years, it's just well, it is what it is. If if they get hurt, well, you know, so be it. You know, and um, because you know there is going to be some some injuries. You know, in, in Origin, but. Um, like I say, everyone that follows our game, you know, really looks forward to Origin, and um, it'd be where it probably does get hard, you know, is for the competition because you know some sides do lose out after Origin if you if you lose players through injury. Um, and the other thing that you know, if they're new to Origin, it can it can affect your club too when they come back because basically when they come back, they're stuffed. Um, as far and it, it, in a physical way, but it's more an emotional way. If you're if they're new to Origin, it's a it's a massive high and they it's a massive build up. So when you build up that high, you, there's some that come down. So sometimes I found you know it takes them six six or seven weeks you know to to really get back to normal after an Origin series if you're not used to it. So it's a, it, it can be a little bit tricky at times you know, for the clubs, but as I said, we all accept it is what it is. All players want to play Origin. They want to represent their state and they want to play State of Origin. And um, so, like, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to go against that or try and hold someone back. At the end of the day, you know, if they get picked for Origin, that's great. Mm, go and give it your best shot. Is that a challenge for you as a coach to, you know, you said the, they come from this major high and then they've got to come back to the club land and represent the club. Is there a, that's a, I imagine that's a challenge for you as a coach to keep them motivated through that whole period to make sure they get through it and they're getting the best results out of themselves? Yeah, I think it's even outside the coach's range, to be quite honest. It's, you know, it's, you'd like them to stay motivated, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's mainly up to them to, to stay 
motivated. And um, I know our, our guys, we sort of, I'm not quite sure how it started or when it started, but we sort of looked on it, or the players looked on it, as a badge of honour to play Origin and then back up for your club. And um, if you've done that, you know, um, that's, you know, you're doing something pretty special for your teammates at your club. And, you know, even though Origin was, was really important for you, you know, I want to back up and show that, you know, I can I can play two games within three or four days. So, um, as I said, you know, a lot of our players there for a while, they, we haven't had that many in Origin now. I think we only had three or four this year. So, but all those guys, you know, the Smiths and the Slayers, the Cronks, um, even you know now with Munster and whatever, like they see as a badge of honour to be able to back up for their their club after a tough Origin go. In uh, 2010, the club faced a couple of challenges. You had the <laughs> you had the the support of your playing group. There's an iconic shot of them standing behind you when you when you do the press conference. To come back from that um, and then still win a premiership a couple of years later, if that's it does it, where does that rank uh, amongst your greatest achievements? And if it's not the best, then what is? Yeah, I think it. With all due respect, I think it does. Um, like that was a that was a tough year uh, to get branded, you know, a team of cheats. Uh, was tough going, and you know it was tough for our players, but it was tough for their families as well. You know, to be branded that and then treated like that. Um, so yeah, like I say, it was. It was a really tough year to get through. Um, it was tough for the players. It was tough for everyone, but especially some of the younger guys. You know, like they, and it was certainly wasn't the players' fault. You know, they. Um, at the end of the day, it was. You know, the the club that that did the wrong thing, not the players. Um, so, you know, it it was just a matter of find our way through that because that happened early in the year like it was around six so I think we had 20 rounds to go and it, it, it was tough going tough going it was you know you couldn't imagine how tough it was but you were for, you weren't able to, we weren't, weren't to play for points yeah, they just yeah, yeah, yeah so um, yeah and there, there was some you know I could go in here for for two hours you know yeah. saying you know what happened during that year and some of the things we had to negotiate you know you know We'll, we'll find our way through the minefield, to be quite honest. Um, and it, it, you know, like, I found found it tough myself. You know, I was I don't know, fifty odd then. You know, and I'd been through a few things in my life. But some of our younger blokes really struggled with. You know, we go to away games and we get off the bus and you know, away fans would be throwing cans at us and spitting mm-hmm. at us and whatever. So that's that was pretty difficult to handle for for younger blokes. But the next year, we, you know, when we lost 14 players um, at the end of that year, um, and 14, you know, a lot of good players, you know, Inglis, Hoffman, you know, we lost Brett, Brett White, um, Adam Blair left, Steve Turner, Brett Fitt, you know, that there was Uber guys that, that we lost. And basically we, because of our salary cap situation, we had to basically bring in guys that were playing reserve grade to other clubs and... And I suppose fast track our a few of our juniors, which they probably weren't quite ready. But in 2011, you know, we won a, a minor premiership. We didn't make the grand final. We got beaten the prelim. But to win a minor premiership with what we went through the year before and 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 the the cal you know the the talent that we had that year was uh, that that's probably I I rate up there the highest. You know, the, the best thing we've done and then the year after in 2012 we won the premiership again mm, yeah, so those sure. couple of years after 2000 or with all due respect 2010 to just getting through that um, and and getting through that and sticking together you know, like it was as I said the, the players that, that left they didn't really want to leave but they sort of someone had to go um, and but you know like the, the guys that were left there after that and after what they went through, you know, to do what they they did the next couple of years was was remarkable. To be quite honest, after that, but um, like I say, it was certainly the toughest thing I've been through in my sporting career. And you know, other than you know some 
best in the family. It was as hard as I've, anything I've had to do in life, to be quite honest. Um, and to come through it like like we did, the the players were um, unbelievably good and unbelievably strong. So we like talking to the, the best of the best, and you know, we we think the Ladbrokes Cox plates the best race in Australia. Uh, you said you're a racing fan. What are your thoughts on the uh, yeah the, the Cox plate? Yeah, well, it's, it's obviously always um, you know, like where I come from. Uh, it's a little country town in Portland, uh, Port called Portland, in New South Wales. And how I got, I got I suppose interested in racing, like when I played footy there, we had the footy field. That, Kramer Parker was called and it had a, a trotting track around it. So there's a few guys important that train trotters. So that's how I sort of got so I used to go to the Bathurst trots and the Lithgow trots a bit with my mates and you know um, <coughs> my mates' dads were interested in that. So um, so I was interested sort of got re- interested in the trots first and then sort of you start getting interested I suppose in the um, in the thoroughbreds and and again, my wife, her dad was a bookmaker, so she's always been interested in the races. So I suppose my first introduction to the races was it was a social event. You know, get on the bag of fruit and off we go and have a few beers and whatever. But like I say, I just got to everyone, you know, obviously the Melbourne Cup was always big, you know, when I was at school and whatever. But um, I remember the, I suppose, the race that really sort of got me really interested in thoroughbred race and it was the Cox Plate in 86 um, and the horse called Bone Crusher and uh, it, it, it stuck out to me because of, you know, it was a chestnut and it looked different but I remember watching it in a few races and it was it's it, it stood out as a racehorse as how I like my footy players though it was tough and it never gave up and I remember that Cox Plate, and I think it was our Waverley Star. I think that was that was the big rival, and they went down the the straight. But the two great New Zealanders have come away on the turn. Our Waverley Star, a half length Bone Crusher. The big red won't give in. Drought running on. Bone Crusher responds to the whip. The roars of the crowd. He races up to our Waverley Star. A hundred out. Bone Crusher. Our Waverley Star. Stride for stride. Nothing in it. Our Waverley star, the rails, Bone Crusher, the outside, and Bone Crusher races into equine immortality. One and a half million dollars as he photo finishes our Waverley star. Yeah, it was unbelievable, like, that the toughness of that horse showed that day, and I was sort of a fan of the, the Cox played after that. And then, like I say, I wasn't, you know, you know, didn't know a whole loop about racing, but obviously since then we all know that yeah, you know, well, the best horses in Australia, or the best horses anywhere, um, race in the Cox Plate, and all the you know the best horses at that time of year um, lose to a great race and a great spectacle, a great spectacle, and um, yeah, you know, everyone loves it. You know, like so, you know, some people go there to to watch the horses to have a bet. Some people go there to socialise, but it's a great day. You know, I've been a couple of times to. Uh, the Cox Plate, and yeah, it's uh, it's a great time. But like I say, it, or, always I've got Bone Crusher to thank for that interest, I suppose. Not a bad race. No, uh, a bad race. We know there's a strong correlation between uh, sporting people and horse ownership. I think some of the Storm boys might be involved. We know Pap uh, loves it. Yeah. Um, have you owned any horses or have had any success in the family yourself? <laughs> um, like I say, for me, it's it's a, it's a social thing. But um, my wife has owned a, a couple of racehorses. Um, as I said, you know, she's really interested in them, and she got that interest through uh, through her dad. Um, you know, being a bookmaker. But he, he not only was the bookmaking for Laurie, he was just interested in the racing as well. So, yeah, I think my wife's had about three or four horses, but. Um, um, I don't think any of them have been first past the post yet, so uh, so I uh, haven't had a whole heap of success. Uh, so we've got a big few months in, in Melbourne ahead. We've got obviously, you know, you, the Storm boys are well and truly in contention for the finals in the, the spring. Um, how, how do you, yeah, how you set up for the rest of the year, um, your Storm boys? And you know, do you think this year, you know, you, you're definitely a chance to kind of uh, take it to them? Yeah, well, again, you know, like I think. Um, 
if you asked me that question last week, we might have been uh, not as confident. But after last night's effort, you know, we just showed that you know we've got you know, that attitude to defend. If we can hang on to that, you know, we'll, we'll yeah we'll be in contention in any game we play. And so um, I think um, certainly that you know it was a shot in the arm with our confidence last night to to defend you know, the way we did to, to hold the. You know, the top team at the moment, which is, I think they're six points ahead, you know, um, in the minor premiership race, to hold them to, to zero on their home ground. They had a couple, some players out, a couple of players out, but having said that, there was still, you know, they still had a good team there. And um, if we can defend like that for the rest of the year, as I said, you know, we see ourselves being in every contest um, for the rest of the year. Awesome. Well, Craig, that's all, that's all we've uh, got for questions uh, thanks for joining us on the podcast and good luck for the rest of the season no I appreciate it guys thanks, thanks a lot no thank you cheers thank you cheers.